Hey guys, so this is the webinar uh, that you've been waiting for. Um, in this webinar, we're going to talk about extreme weight loss, how to burn the most fat um, despite having a slow metabolism. So it's taken me a long time to consolidate and make this really, really simple for you. So I'm going to walk you through step-by-step -step exactly what to do. And you'd want to use this if you have a slow metabolism, if you're plateaued, if let's say you're going through menopause or you have hypothyroidism or you just want to lose a lot of weight real quick. If you understand these principles, um, you can lose as much weight as you want. It's a bit extreme, but it's also healthy. So you don't have to worry about anything related to your health. It's just a little, it's going to take a little more discipline. So I'm going to pull up my um, PowerPoint slides. Here we go right here. All right, so let's just, uh, good, so let's just dive right in, okay? Um, I have a number of slides we're gonna go through, very A to B, no fluff, just you might wanna take notes, okay? So first thing we're gonna talk about is carbs. Um, there's a, if you're new to uh, my channel, um, we're gonna talk about ketosis. Ketosis is basically fat burning. Um, if you're trying to lose weight, of course, you want to focus on burning your fat, right? Not burning your muscles or just sugar fuel or just water weight. We want to actually burn fat. The way to do it is you must drop your carbs. Now, in ketosis, um, the, the range of carbohydrates is usually between 20 and 50 grams per day, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to bring it down to as close to zero as possible. And what I'm gonna do as I go through this presentation is just give you the key things that you can do if you want to implement. So there's a lot of different strategies. You can combine all of them or some of them, but these are the things that will help you lose the most weight, regardless of how slow your metabolism is, okay? You may not need to do this, I mean, as extreme as I'm talking about, but at least you, you can turn up the dial as much as you want, okay? So we want to get into deep ketosis. That means dropping our carbs as close to zero as possible. Um, but maybe not zero because I'm going to recommend using lemon juice. Um, there's like very small amount of carbs in lemons, but it does have some. Uh, there's a very small amount of carbs in eggs. It's not going to be a big deal. Maybe some seeds. Maybe there's a little bit of carbs in leafy vegetables. Um, but we want to do this healthily because if you don't, add some vegetables, it's going to be hard to get your minerals. It's going to be hard to get your fiber to feed the microbes. So I'm building in all the safeguards to make sure when you lose the weight, you do it healthily and you look good as you're losing weight. So you don't look like a crackhead. You know, you're looking all old and things. So, um, so let's just kind of dive in. Um, of course, there's no limit to leafy greens. Um, of course, we're not going to recommend corn, peas, beets, carrots, tomatoes, squash. But if your metabolism is fast, you can easily add tomatoes and squash, carrots and beets and peas, but not corn. I just don't recommend it because it's normally always GMO. Um, so I'm just kind of just get, walk you through the most important things. Avocados are totally fine. I would avoid berries, okay? I would avoid, avoid berries. All right. I just want to touch on one thing, and it's called insulin resistance. What's behind a slow metabolism, um, a metabolism where, whereby you're trying to lose weight and then you plateau, and you cannot get below that certain weight. What's stopping you is something called insulin resistance. You have um, a problem where your body's not absorbing insulin that well, um, and your body makes too much of it, so you have too much insulin. Okay, that's, that's really the problem. In the presence of that much insulin, you're not going to lose weight. And so what we want to do is we want to correct insulin resistance. Um, there's a couple ways. Dropping carbs is one. Uh, the other is feeding your microbes in your gut. Um, you have about, I don't know, 24 to 26 feet of intestines. The last part, which is called the colon, the large intestine, uh, that has most of your microbes, probably like 95% of all of the microbes. Uh, and that's where um, 
all the fermentation of the fiber occurs. And these microbes eat fiber, and the fiber we're going to feed them are vegetable fibers, okay, from leafy greens, salads, things like that. Now, that being said, if you bloat with a lot of vegetables, of course, cut it back. I'm assuming you're not going to bloat. Um, I do recommend consuming a lot of vegetables, like between 7 and 10 cups, to achieve your nutrient levels, okay? Some people can't do that. Uh, you have to work up to it, but I'm just going to tell you one of the reasons why to do that is to, not just for the, the potassium and magnesium, which will also lower insulin resistance, but the fiber feeds the microbes, and the microbes then give you, in exchange, something really cool. It's called butyrate. What is butyrate? Butyrate is a natural compound that not only feeds the colon cells and give you, gives you energy, but butyrate also majorly um, helps you restore your in normal insulin levels. So it's very good for a blood sugar problem, and it's really good to correct insulin resistance. Okay? That is why we're going to do this. Um, okay, so we got that. All right, now protein, okay? Um, I'm gonna recommend moderate protein, and that means three to six ounces of protein per meal. Now with the ketogenic plan, the healthy version I'm gonna recommend, uh, we always have this confusion of protein and fat. What does it look like? I'm gonna give you a lot of examples so you can visualize. I think if you could see this, um, you can do it. Um, so I'm gonna actually show you pictures in a second. Um, I'm going to recommend that you always consume most of your fat with your protein together in one food versus trying to add a lot of extra fat with lean protein or protein powder. I don't recommend that. Um, and there's a couple reasons. I'm not going to get into it, but it's just healthier if you eat it as one complex and not do lean or low fat anything. When you go lean protein, you spike insulin more than the whole fat. So the fat is really, really key. So we want to do three to six ounces of protein per meal. If you're a big person, okay, you're going to need a little bit more, maybe seven or eight ounces. If you're going to start doing intermittent fasting, which we'll talk about, and you start doing less meals, you might need a little more protein as well, because that's your only, only meal of the day. Okay, so um, I'll show you as we get into it. The more protein that you consume though in one meal, the higher the insulin spike, and we're trying to keep insulin low. Uh, a lot of this protein that you eat, well, not a lot of it, a good portion of it, is not used as calories, as fuel. It's used to repair body tissue. Um, so we're always dealing with the ability to digest that protein, too, uh, and a quality uh, source of protein. So salmon is a really good quality. Fish, other fish, eggs are really good. Grass-fed um, protein is really good. Uh, whey protein is, is not is very low on the list, okay? Um, okay, so we got into that. Let's go on to the next one. Um, salmon, other fatty fish, the best. Salmon has omega-3 fatty acids. One of the omega-3 fatty acids is called DHA. It's really good for the brain, okay? It's really good to repair um, a damaged brain. It's very important in a growing um, baby, um, but a good portion of the brain um, is made out of DHA. So you're going to be very, very safe if you do uh, um, foods with high amounts of those omega-3 fatty acids compared to the omega-6 fatty acids, which is all the seed oils and the vegetable oils, like the corn oil, so soy oil, that you get it when you go out to eat or you know, a lot of recipes, they have this vegetable oil. It's not very good. It's very inflammatory, and it worsens the um, insulin resistance situation. DHA and omega-3 fatty acids improve uh, this situation. Sardines, really good source of omega-3. Hamburger, do not get the extra lean hamburger. Get the fattiest hamburger you can eat. That way you get your fat with your protein. Um, it's going to create a lot less spike on your insulin, okay? So just to hammer this home, lean protein spikes insulin more than fatty protein, okay? I know some of you are saying, well, what about the calories? Well, we'll get to that in a second. All right, eggs. Um, make sure they're pasture-raised 
eggs, okay, organic eggs, if possible, versus um, like pasteurized eggs, you don't want to get that. You want to get pasture raised, like chickens that go out in the grass, okay? I get my eggs at the farmer's market and um, from small farmers. Um, okay, duck eggs are awesome, awesome. If you can get those, it's, the, the yolks are huge. Very, very good, uh, especially for your liver, by the way. Uh, I personally do four eggs a day. Um, I've been doing it forever. Um, I'm not going to get into cholesterol in this presentation. You can watch my other videos for that. But realize your body makes a good amount of cholesterol, like a lot. So when you eat more, your body makes less. Okay. Um, also, cholesterol is needed for the hormones, cell membranes, a lot of things. Seafood, very good, very important for trace minerals, things like zinc, selenium. These are um, minerals that will help with a lot of different things. Um, but at the end of the day, we want you to consume foods that supply all your nutrients, okay? And trace minerals are a big one that's usually missing. Some of you are not into consuming pork. It's totally fine. You don't have to. Um, I, I believe um, just my personal feeling is that if you have a high quality um, pork product, um, it's fine. But that's just my own viewpoint. Um, so I go to the farmer's market and I find out what these pigs are eating and I, um, I, I don't <laughs> go to, I don't buy my, my bacon from 7-Eleven, okay, or the, or the supermarket that, you know, the process section, I don't do that with the nitrates and the sugars and all that. But the main thing is what they feed the pork, you know, like they'll do GMO grains. Uh, we don't want to do that. And if you, if you think pork is worse than chicken, I mean, chicken is really, really bad unless it's fed non-GMO um, food. So as you're doing the beef and the pork and the chicken, whatever, make sure you do organic. Um, grass-fed would be better. If you do dairy, um, make sure it's grass-fed, organic. Very important. So avoid the whey protein powder. Chicken, unless it's high quality. Um, and also, don't, don't eat the chicken without the skin. You need the fat on it. Um, I think the fat on a skinless chicken is like 13%, which is crazy low. And um, there's a lot of problems with that. Um, I'm not going to get into it in this video, but I will have another video on that. Okay, turkey, too lean, um, protein powders. At this point, I don't recommend them. Lean fish, uh, get the fatty fish. Um, Lean meat, including hamburger, is out, so we don't want to do that either. All right, so now um, what to avoid. In this program, um, we're going to avoid nuts. They do have uh, some hidden carbs. And, and basically, I'm giving you all the things that you should do if you have some sluggishness with your metabolism and you want to speed things up. Okay, so if you, if you don't have a problem with your metabolism, you can do nuts. But... I would cut them out if you're having a hard time losing weight. You'd be surprised how much weight you can lose by cutting out the nuts. First of all, it's hard to digest, okay? Um, plus, they have a little more carbs, and people are loading up with nuts, and they feel bloated, and it can definitely slow you down. The other thing, too, I mentioned dairy. Uh, you may want to just avoid all dairy at this point. Uh, what about some cream in your coffee? That's going to be fine. It's a very small amount. I mean, if you have half and half, the amount of carbs you get is like so tiny. Uh, it'd be better to do a whole cream. But um, for the most part, if you definitely avoid yogurt, milk, kefir um, at this point, um, just because so many people uh, have inflammation from dairy. Some people, so many people can't digest it. It could be constipating. Some of the dairy does have carbs. And just to speed things up, we're going to avoid it. Now, I want to talk about fat, but this relates to protein because in nature, nothing ever comes exactly as fat. It usually is a combination of fat and protein. Uh, but I want to talk about this. When you do a keto plan, they talk about 70 to 75% of your total calories being fat. Now, what the heck does that mean? I mean, I'm going to show you a like a visual of that, but we're not even, we're not even doing 70 to 75% at this point. And the reason for that is that this is more of an extreme version of the keto that I recommend in my book. This is mainly for people 
that have that need um, the X factor. They need to go. They need something stronger because there's a plateau. They're plateaued and they're stuck. Okay. So if you go too high in your fat, um, your body will burn the fat calories possibly more than your own fat. Okay, that's not what we're trying to do. In the very beginning, I think it's very important to increase fat to be able to go longer without having to eat because we're gonna implement intermittent fasting in a second. But, um, but as you start adapting, we wanna cut the fat down, not to a low fat, but to about 75 grams of fat or a little bit less. If you do that, your body will burn a lot more of its own fat. If we go too low on the fat, you're going to end up with deficiencies and all sorts of other problems. We don't want to do that. But I want to just give you a total visual on what this looks like, okay? So what does 75 grams of fat look like? Here's an example right here. Eight ounces of salmon. Okay, this is like, a, this is like your protein and fat for one day, okay? Eight ounces of salmon. We got two tablespoons of butter. Maybe you use that to cook something. Uh, mac nuts, which again, we're not recommending the nuts, but uh, some people might be able to get away with them. Out of all the nuts, though, the macadamia nuts are the fattiest. Um, so that would be a good thing. And they're also low on the uh, oxalate uh, level. So they're not going to actually aggravate the, um, any potential stone issues if you are a stone former. Same thing with pistachios. But anyway, this is what it looks like right here. Okay, here's another example. Eight strips of bacon. And just so you know what I eat in the morning, or actually I don't eat in the morning. My first meal is like at three o'clock and I will have my breakfast at three o'clock and I'll have four eggs and I'll take one of those packets of bacon and I'll normally kind of cut in half and I'll have half of that. So you might say, wow, that's a lot of bacon. It's actually a lot of the fat cooks off and it's not a tremendous amount of protein. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's, it's something, but it's not like what you would think. Um, so here's salmon, uh, I'm sorry, the sardines, um, which is a high quality source of omega-3. Then we got coconut oil right here and the brie cheese. Again, uh, for, for some people, I wouldn't recommend the brie cheese, but I just want to show you what 75 or 70, roughly 70 or 71 grams of fat looks like per day, just so you can get a visualized, visual, visual on this. Uh, I'm going to show you more examples, but I think it's important for you just to kind of get an eyeball because when you do keto, like some people say, Oh my gosh, I'm just living on pure grease and, and it's all going to be just this huge chunk of fat. No, not really. Look at this 74 grams of fat, eight ounce burger, three cheese, one tablespoon of olive oil. Now you put that on your salad. That's not a lot of fat. Okay. Here's another one. We have um, tuna, four ounces. We got the bacon, eight strips. Got one, one egg, olive oil, one tablespoon, little macadamia nuts. It's not that much. Here's another one, two tablespoons of butter. Uh, we got one fourth avocado, an eight ounce hamburger patty, 75 grams. So are you starting to see it's like, this is not terribly a lot of fat, but it's not low fat either. Okay, got that? Here's another one. We've got uh, salad dressing, two tablespoons. Personally, I do olive oil and vinaigrette, uh, balsamic on my salads, and then I put a little Parmesan cheese. Okay, so eight ounce salmon, um, and then we got uh, two MCT oil. I'm gonna recommend that you probably not do MCT, uh, MCT oil on this initially, um, unless your metabolism is fine, because even though it turns on the ketones and you have a lot of energy, it, it might be a problem um, with you tapping in your own fat. However, that being said, if you have a pre-existing heart problem or a brain problem where you have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or you have some type of heart issue, MCT oil is awesome because it'll give you, give your brain more ketones to use directly and it bypasses this insulin resistance and it feeds the cell directly and you will get lots more energy and you'll have a better uh, output in your heart. You'll be less tired too. Okay, coconut oil. Look at that. All right, got, got that. Keep it simple. 
just trying to make this simple as possible, okay? Now I've got intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is another tool. But here's the big rule. Do not eat unless you are hungry, okay? So many people are eating and they're not hungry. If there's times you're not hungry, don't eat. Why? Because your body is eating your own fat. And as soon as you eat, you're going to stop that process. So we don't want to do that. We want you in fat burning 24-7. Okay. So you start with three meals a day. Okay. See this right here, these spikes, insulin, insulin, insulin. Um, and then we have, um, we don't have any snacks. We're adding fat at the meal to be able to go longer and longer. Now, every time you eat, you trigger insulin. So we want to keep, we want to start working on cutting down the frequency of eating over a gradual period of time, maybe two weeks. Okay. But if you start with three meals a day, no snacks and cut the carbs down, your body now is going to drop insulin and you're not going to be as hungry. So you can go longer without eating. So now you start fasting. Okay. So the ideal scene is to be able to, um, do this, do three meals. And then you wake up in the morning and you ask yourself, am I hungry? And you go, no. Don't eat. And you keep pushing your, your breakfast further and further and further and further until there is no breakfast. And you got two meals, lunch and dinner. Okay, you do that for a while. And then what you want to do with this is you want to start pushing these meals closer and closer. So eat later because you're not hungry. Remember, you're, you're going, you're going, you're not hungry. Eventually, you're going to be going till maybe one o'clock and you're like, wow, I'm not even hungry. Or maybe even three o'clock, I'm not even hungry. And then you'll be hungry and then you'll eat. But let your body tell you when to eat. This is kind of a natural process of adapting to your fat reserves. An average person who doesn't have a lot of extra weight to lose has 100,000 calories of fat sitting on their bodies. Okay? So, but the ideal is to go step one and step two, which is we're squishing our, our eating window to a four hour window. Okay? So, um, one to five. Let's see. Two, three, four, five. Yeah. So four hours of eating right here. And then we got a 20 hour fasting. Okay. That's going to be huge. But some of you might already be doing this and you're still not losing weight. Okay. So, so you're going to ask me, what do I do? Well, I'm showing you all the strategies one step at a time. And then if, it, if it's not working for you, but let, let's say here, you don't have a gallbladder. They took out your thyroid. You're going through menopause. You died in your whole life. You have no metabolism, um, and you're exercising six hours a day, and it's still not working. <laughs> um, just stay tuned. I'll show you what to do. Um, okay, so I already said this. Okay, the best clue that it's working is that your hunger disappears. Okay, if your hunger is still there, you still have an insulin problem. So as the hunger disappears, you know it's starting to work. Ride the wave. Go as long as possible so until you're at one meal a day. I have so many people right now that are doing one meal a day without any problem. They feel great and um, they can lose a lot of weight. Most people, some people can't. I'm going to tell you what to do if you're in that boat. But one meal a day gives you like 23 hours of fasting. This is huge because 23 hours of fasting is going to give you um, an amazing ability to repair and heal and run your body on fat. Okay. And you're going to feel good. You're going to have more energy. Um, but some people are not going to be able to do that. So what they're going to have to do is do um, one meal every other day. Now, I don't recommend jumping into this. Get to one meal a day and then just ask yourself, am I hungry? And if the answer is no, then don't eat. Go another day without eating. That will work for a lot of people that just, you, what's happening with, the, with people that can't lose weight, even on OMAD, which is one meal a day, their metabolism is wrecked. I mean, they, they, something in the past, you know, screw them up. It could be severe insulin resistance. It could be some diabetes. It could be something. When you do this every other day eating, um, you are going to um, run, you're not starving. You're going to run off your stored fat a heck of a lot more. And that's when you're going to start seeing huge changes, like huge changes. Do I recommend it for everyone? No. But for those people that need to do this, it's an option. I want, I want to give you tools so you know, um, have a backup strategy if something doesn't work.
So this is kind of the pie chart that I want you to look at. Um, most keto plans have 70 or even 80% fat. In this extreme plan, it's 55% fat and it's 39% protein. So it's a little, it's adjusted, okay? Um, so you're doing a little more protein, a little less fat, uh, because we want, we want to tap into it. If we increase the fat a little bit more and decrease the protein, what happens is we, we don't get the right ratios uh, with someone with a slow metabolism. So this is kind of a little, kind of a hack of a thing that I found that seems to work. Uh, notice that we have mandatory vegetables in there too, okay, uh, with, um, with fiber. Uh, of course, non-starchy, leafy greens. I've never met any person that had slower weight loss by eating a salad unless they had like uh, some intestinal bloating or something like that which could be a situation. Um, notice that the carb is 1%, and I'm building that in there because like maybe lemon water, which I recommend you take lemon juice, take the, a little juice, like one ounce in your water every day, just to help you with, when you're in keto ketosis, some people um, potentially have more uric acid, and the lemon juice will counter that. Some people develop more stones, the, the lemon juice will help, help you with that. Um, if you're a stone foam former, that means that you have a situation where it's super concentrated um, urine in your kidneys, and that's where you develop a stone. One very simple guarantee to prevent a stone would just be to consume uh, minimally two liters of water a day. It's not too bad. Two to, two, two to three uh, liters a day of water and um, I recommend you exercise to sweat as well, but um, that fluid with some apple cider vinegar, with some lemon, then your, your kidneys will never have a super concentrated um, fluid in there to develop stones. You'll prevent the stones, okay? It's a little tip. All right, so, all right, we got the carbs low, uh, we got protein, we got fat, vegetables, okay? We're not done yet. We have other tools that we can add. Uh, periodic prolonged fasting. We talked about intermittent fasting, going one meal a day and potentially one meal every other day. That's one strategy. But there's some other things you can do to take it to the next level, especially if you have, um, let's say you have Alzheimer's or you have Parkinson's or you have some type of autoimmune condition or, or you just wanna pick up the pace. This is very, very, very powerful because periodic prolonged fasting um, can create increased stem cells. You can grow new brain cells. You can drop inflammation like you've never seen before in your body. Um, so every so often, maybe once a month, you do a 48 to 72 hour fast once a month. Powerful, powerful. It's very anti-cancer too. Tumors can't live on ketones, by the way. All right, and then on weekends, you do a 40-hour fast. Of course, if you're doing every other day, you'll probably hit that right here, won't you? Um, but the point is you want to do these periodic fasts here and there, P periodic prolonged fasting. Okay, here's some tips. Do it gradually because you don't know uh, your, your mineral reserve. You don't know how many, how, much, how many vitamins uh, that you're deficient in subclinically or, or nutrients or minerals. So you wanna go into this kind of gradually um, so you don't like deplete yourself. This is why I recommend taking electrolytes and also B vitamins uh, in sea salt. Why you're doing this? Just to make sure, you know, and then you're gonna be fine. There was a guy who uh, fasted, the, he took the record, 384 days, I think it was. No food, but he was, medically supervised, but he took nutrients, okay? Electrolytes, B vitamins, sea salt. Um, so anyway, uh, do it gradually, um, add sea salt. You need one, one teaspoon of sea salt per day, kind of average, one teaspoon per day. Some of this is gonna be built in the food, but you need that, okay? You can even add it to some water as well, slowly, not the whole thing. Um, also electrolytes. I'm, I'm not biased and I'm being sarcastic that I have the best electrolytes out there, but you might want to try mine because it has a thousand milligrams of potassium, 
that it's in the form of citrate, okay, which is really anti-stone. So it's going to combine with any potential oxalates that you get from spinach or any other food that you're eating, like almonds, which you're not doing almonds. But the point is that it can actually counter potential stones. It also has magnesium citrate in it. Uh, it has um, calcium citrate and um, it has some chlorides in there as a sea salt. But it's not big on sea salt, so it's not like a salt replacement. You just have to add salt. It's more of a, the other electrolytes. Um, and it also has trace minerals in there, so it's, it's pretty darn good. No sugar, no multidextrin, uh, high-quality stuff. The B vitamins, very essential. I recommend you get it from Nutritional Yeast. I do also have something you could try. It's, a, it's in a tablet. I take them. I chew them. They're, they're kind of big tablets. You can swallow them or chew them. Uh, but B vitamins are natural. Get the one that's unfortified. Here's just a picture of mine, nutritional yeast tablets, non-fortified, but I did add B12. And then this is the electrolytes I have. I have a, um, a lemon raspberry flavor. I have a new one coming out, which is orange. It's really good. It's not, I don't think it's out yet. It should, you might want to check. Um, by the time you're watching this, I don't know, but there's two different flavors. Um, and then I also have it in packs. Um, but you take one scoop a day. And it gives you a lot of potassium. The minerals help with insulin resistance as well. Here's another hack. Rotating the times you eat. Okay, so let's say, for example, you have this pattern. You're eating one meal a day at 6 o'clock. Well, let your body tell you when to eat. Maybe the next day you're eating at night. You're doing one meal a day, let's say, at this point. You're not doing every other day. Let's say you do 3 o'clock. And then the next day you do 4 o'clock. The next day you do seven o'clock. You can rotate that. It doesn't have to be at the same time. If you rotate, okay, and then you also stagger your prolonged fasting, so it's kind of irregular, it really will help um, you lose even more weight because your body gets so used to this thing that it starts to adapting. It can start getting used to it, start slowing down. So you want to kind of surprise your body. Same thing with the exercise. You switch up your pattern every so often, and it's called uh, muscle confusion. Uh, apple cider vinegar, very, 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 very important to help with insulin resistance. Um, it'll help to lower insulin. And what you do is you take a tablespoon. I take two tablespoons. I put it in a big thing of water, and I usually drink my, a good portion of my water in the morning. But um, it really will help you. Okay, add the lemon in there. It can be just uh, lemon juice or an actual lemon. Stress reduction, okay? Long walks on the days that you don't work out are very good for stress, but I also have, you can on your own time watch, uh, do a search in Dr. Berg's stress webinar. I actually walk you through um, five different techniques that you can do on yourself or get someone to do it on you to drop your stress level and help enhance your sleep, okay, because it's all about dropping cortisol. Um, but this is a, um, a good video to watch on stress. Sleep. If you get more sleep, you'll have better insulin levels, you have better blood sugars, you'll be less hungry, you'll lose more weight. Most of the fat is burned at night. If you're not sleeping, that could be the big reason why you're not losing weight. Um, I will say, though, as you do this, the, the requirement for sleep goes down, but it's very, very important to get enough sleep. So I would, if I were you, I would try to get eight hours, okay? Can you take a nap to help that? Absolutely, but the sleep is going to be key. The stress reduction techniques I show you will help enhance the sleep. Going for long walks will help, doing, help the sleep. The electrolytes will help the sleep. The B vitamins help to sleep. So a lot of things will kind of come together for you. Um, there are certain sleep aids that I have online if you need them, um, but you don't want to start taking melatonin. That's one thing you don't want to take. Exercise. Okay, there's some tips with exercise I want to talk about. Again, we're just going to combine all these different really cool things. Um, exercise is only responsible for 15% of your weight loss. So it's not the big thing, but it does other things. It'll start to build. If you do regular periodic exercise over time, it creates a lot of oxidative stress, but your body adapts and it starts to um, build up a network of antioxidants. Your body actually makes antioxidants. 
a bigger, bigger group that will actually protect the damage that even on your cells are making from the exercise. So that's one way to build up, it's called your antioxidant network. Uh, I did a video on that recently, and I think it's an anti-aging video, but exercise, exercise, um, very, very vital to, to just add to everything. I would highly recommend you exercise in your fasting state when, when you haven't eaten. That will spike growth hormone, okay? So that's one thing. Number two, the intensity of the exercise is what spikes growth hormone. The more intense, the more growth hormone. Growth hormone is the main fat burning hormone. The ideal best exercise to stimulate growth hormone would be sprinting. Sprinting is very painful because it's like an explosive thing. Um, but if you could do seven cycles of a 30 second sprint, that would be hot. Uh, you might not be up to it, that's fine. Uh, do your bike, do your uh, aerobic class, spin bike, but do something, um, that would be important. Um, you would spike the most growth hormone, okay, let's see, you spike the most growth hormone up to seven, 700% more when you're sprinting. That's huge. Most people have to gradually ease into this, yeah, okay, so use a full body type exercise uh, like burpees and planks and plyometrics, jumping ropes, spinning, versus like just weights. Um, here's the thing. When you do fasting, that can stimulate growth hormone by 2,000% in men, 1,300% in women. So you can see exercise is only 700%, but still um, we got a good situation because we have this, uh, this growth hormone that is anti-aging, and you're going to start looking good as you're losing weight. Okay, then we have interval training, which I recommend. Um, the magic time frame of doing interval training is between 20 and 40 minutes, okay? If you do it longer, you tend to lose your gains because you overdo it and you overtrain. Um, if you're over the age of 40, you definitely need to do two times a week, maybe once a week, and gradually go into it. Um, my wife and I were, I'm 50, uh, I'm 50, I think I'm 54, she's 55 or six, don't quote me. But here's the thing. Uh, we, work, we, we do hardcore interval training twice a week. Um, and on the other days, I, I will work some other muscles and things, but I'll do cardio, I'll do the bike every other day. And so I'm doing hills and things like that. But it takes a while for your body to recover. It's best, to, it's best when you work out to get to the point where you're doing it enough so you're sore. Then wait till you fully recover then to do some exercise and you're trying to, you're kind of halfway going through it, you're not sore and you're doing that more frequently, you're not gonna see the gains. You wanna get sore, okay? So you're gonna have to increase the intensity or maybe even the volume. Okay guys, I just gave you um, a tremendous amount of uh, summarized information. It might, might seem simple, but it took me a long time to kind of make it simple. Um, I have this entire program in a document that you can download. Um, it's called Keto on Steroids Cheat Sheet. Cheat Sheet. And it's an updated version from my original one. Um, and I do charge for it. It's very, very expensive. It's a dollar. And the reason I do this is because I just don't wanna give every single thing away for free. I want you to at least invest something. So you'll actually, if you invest in something, you'll actually, I found, you'll take advantage of it more, you'll implement it more than if everything is just given free. So it does cost a dollar. You can go to drbird.com and it's just keto-on-steroids, okay? So it's drbird.com forward slash keto-on-steroids. It should be a link down below. You can get the summary sheet, download it, follow it, get all the details, implement it. It will work. And uh, I'm telling you, out of everything that um, I've tried over the years after, you know, been in practice 29 years, I personally worked one-on-one -on -one with over 40,000 people, um, and I've tried so many different things. This is the thing that is the most powerful that you should focus on the most. Now you have the ability, if you can go through this, to turn up the dial as much as you want or down as low as you want, because this is strict. This is extreme. Uh, this is hardcore. So you might not be there with your discipline, but you might be like really, really um, good with intermittent fasting, but you're not perfect with the carbs. 
Okay, good. Well, then do more intermittent fasting. Or let's say you're not really good with intermittent fasting, but you're good with the carbs. Um, or let's say you're not good with intermittent fasting nor the carbs. Then you're going to need to go really quality food. At least you're getting good quality food, right? So anyway, I gave you a lot of uh, parts of the um, parts of this puzzle. Now it's up to you to get started. Get started, and please give me your success story as well. Thank you so much uh, for um, attending this webinar, and I hope you enjoyed it. And comment below if you did enjoy it. Thank you.